Welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Angela Yeager. I'm pleased to have with me on the show today two guest hosts, so double your money, uh, Ernie Kiros and Brian Hart. Welcome to the show, both of you. Hey, hey. thanks for having us. And Ernie and Har Brian have never been on the show together before, but they've both been on here separately. And uh, to talk about, we're going to be talking about the Sundance Film Festival this year. Um, it just so turns out, even though I know both Brian and Ernie from totally different walks of life, that both of these gentlemen have been going to the Sun, Sundance Film Festival in different capacities for about 20 years, uh, or at least give or take. Um, Brian Hart, uh, has, who's a regular on this show, has been there as a volunteer, and I think this last year as a manager, ooh, moving up in the world, um, at the Egyptian Theater, right? Is that where you've been, vol you volunteered at the same theater all 20 years? Is that right, Brian? Uh, my very first year, I was at the library, and 19 years after that has all been at the Egyptian Theater. All, right, so all the midnight shift, too. Yes, he's the late night guy. So he has lots of stories from the past that he can't tell here on the show, but about some of the more <laughs> wild midnight showings. There's some good Crispin Glover stories out there if you all need some, <laughs> some entertainment. Um, and so he's been going as a volunteer, but which means he crams in as many movies as possible uh, every year. I know in recent years, you've kind of dwindled on the amount you've crammed because you have friends and everything that you like to see now, but what's your record, Brian? Uh, I think I've seen 39, which I was still disappointed that I didn't hit 40. Okay. But, uh, yeah, 39. In two weeks. Yeah. Is it almost two weeks? 10 days, yeah. 10 days. And then, but, and then yeah. Ernie, you've been going as, uh, as a programmer. Of course, you work for Sundance now as a programmer, but you've also been going for about 20 years. Is that right? Uh, well, it was 20 years ago that I went as a filmmaker for the first time, 2004. Uh, and I've been going off and on since then. I can't remember exactly. You know, I didn't go every year. I think I'm maybe like 12 or 13 Sundances in. Um, okay. First as a filmmaker and now uh, for like the last 12 years as a programmer, either for Sundance or for other festivals. Yeah. But now you were officially as an associate programmer. Is that your official title? Associate programmer for the last three years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I use, there's a whole industry section that's completely separate from Main Street from where Brian's at. Uh, and I unfortunately don't get up to Main Street as often as I can and because they kind of keep us separate. We have like our own little screens that aren't open to the public. And um, and then, of course, with COVID, that changed a lot of things. And there's an online portion. There's an in-person portion. So, yeah. Yes. And I've only ever done the in, uh, online portion. So I started attending Sundance is just one of your, you know, peon uh, viewers during COVID, actually, when they first started allowing online access. And every year it's been a little different. Like the first year they did it, they were like, you can watch everything. And it was great, except for like the app didn't work and there was lots of technological problems and half the time the films didn't show on time. And there was lots of issues. This year the app worked like perfect, 100% perfect. And they actually now have the talkbacks and all the interviews and stuff on there too, which in the past you had to like go on the computer to watch that. It wasn't part of the app, but they only limited us to like 10 movies. And I bought like two extra tickets because there were a couple other films I really wanted to see. So I ended up only seeing 12 films, which is quite a bit less than both of you. Um, what, what would you say if there was like a theme this year or a certain vibe at the festival, anything you'd want to tell people about since you were there in person? From the industry point of view, I felt like there was a lot of talk about Sundance moving or Sundance ending. I don't know if if you guys have been following. Um, everyone, I feel like there's this thing, you know, Sundance as is, isn't sustainable in Park City anymore. And so there's been talk about, does it, is it going to move to Salt Lake City? Is it going to move to Santa Fe? And I think they just, the Sundance organization just signed a, a deal for like, I think to the end of 2026 to stay in Park City. Uh, but that seemed to be just sort of the undercurrent, a lot of kind of rumors and, and whisperings that I heard of like, oh, is it going to move? And what does that mean if it's going to move? And just, you know, yeah. Um, 
because it just the infrastructure it just it's it's a huge undertaking and uh uh very expensive and it's not really accessible for a lot of people for a for a lot of reasons uh either financially or even from a from a physical you know accessibility you know there's no handicapped uh it's just it's very uh it does have a, a tendency to be very elitist you know for who can go um so that that i felt like that was a lot of things that were going on in the industry world of just what's going to happen with sun in the future interesting yeah were you hearing some of that same buzz brian or uh different vibe yeah def definitely uh you know the the biggest theater the echoes closed i think after the first weekend or maybe tuesday was its last day and also one of the other bigger theaters so that that between that and the contract negotiation i think everybody was like it's over it's done you know everybody likes to start start a lot of rumors and everybody's talking about everything there so but yeah i'm glad to hear i didn't hear that they signed so that's good because i can't you know as much as it is kind of an elitist thing but uh i think just having it at park city is so magical up there in the mountain and if they, especially if they moved it to santa fe or or you know la it would take the mystique of that festival away you know i feel like even though the uh entourage and the and the filmmakers are kind of on because they're set trying to sell their movie but i feel like they let their guard down a little bit because they're not in hollywood and it's not their daily grind and their circuit that they're used to and they're just a little more approachable a little more you can have a human conversation with them um so i hope it doesn't go away i love going up there and escaping in the mountains i am super fortunate that i get a volunteer there for 20 years now uh so i just don't want it to go away I could see that. I could also say it's getting maybe too big for that area or, but I can also say that as someone who myself has accessibility issues, it's one of the reasons I yeah. never go there. Um, yeah. So I could, I can see both sides of that, but I, there, there is something yeah. about not being in a bigger city where there would probably be even more kind of less of an intimacy feeling as big as Sundance has gotten to. So yeah, with that, let's yeah, get I've been, No, I've, oh, I've, been to, I've been to festivals in like New York and it's not the same because in New York City, like who cares? Like you're there, it's a drop in the bucket. Being at Sundance is everyone's there for the festival. Everyone you meet, you're walking down the street and you can literally talk to anyone and just start talking to them because they're there for the festival. And you're not, everyone, you know, has the same goal and has the same, you know, it's a, it's a small town vibe and you're going to lose that if you do go to somewhere else. And I totally, I totally, uh, yeah. you know, all the other issues, but yeah, it just, it can't, it, it can't exist anywhere else. And it, it a little bit like Telluride in that way, which I know is one of your favorite festivals to go to, Ernie, in that, you know, when the festival's there, it's all about the movies and it's not a big city and it's not that access, hard, easy to get to Telluride, right? Because it is also up in the mountains, so. Yeah, I mean, and I, I guess that's kind of the point is that you, 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 everyone, you take the time off, you make a little bit of effort to go somewhere and you're all there to celebrate cinema. That, yeah, that's exactly. Okay, well, I will say one dive. thing too. Okay, so, before we dive in, I know we got to get going, but Sundance has, I thought, in the last two or three years, made a big emphasis on accessibility. I know in our training, it's a full <laughs> module of things to do, even the right uh, verbiage and what to say, what you shouldn't say, what's acceptable these days. So they're trying, but there's, yeah, when, when you're in old theaters, it's hard. You know, on the other end, they actually are, they do make an effort financially to reach out to filmmakers and, or uh, programmers, uh, people in the industry of color uh, that are not traditionally represented, that maybe their organizations or individuals, they can't afford to go. They do make an effort to have things like grants and other things uh, so that they can go. So they are, you're right, they are making efforts on multiple fronts to change that. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's that's good to know. And I do love having the online access. I know I complain about the only 10 films because I'd like to see, I could have done 20 myself, but because um, they only allow you for like three days too. It's a very short window of time, but at least I got to see some. So with that, let's get into the movies. Brian, I think you're up with your, we each picked just so everyone knows kind of like our two favorites or two favorites that we wanted to discuss. And we made a point of picking different films. So you viewers could um, get an idea of of a good breadth of films that we're showing. So go ahead, Brian. Yes, uh, so I also felt that this year, uh, there was a lot of really good films. I felt like it was elevated from, at least last year, it was a little bit softer in total 
good quality film. So I was really excited to, to pick my films this year. It was hard. My first one is Exhibiting Forgiveness. So it's directed by Titus Kafar, who is an internationally recognized um, artist. Uh, and he has permanent art collections in Detroit, Chicago, New York, and many others. And this is his feature, fe uh, feature debut. So he's done a few short films. Uh, but this is a semi bio <laughs> A semi autobiographical, uh, I can't say it. It's based on his life, sort of. <laughs> Good job, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a black artist um, who's on the path to success and then is derailed by an unexpected visit from his estranged father, who's a recovering addict, but he's desperate to reconcile with his son and his family. Uh, the cast is stellar. Uh, it uh, stars Andre Holland, who was in Moonlight, uh, John. Earl Jelks, who's in a lot of things, um, Anjanu Ellis Taylor, and Andre Day. And this was a movie where about three quarters of the way through, I was so engrossed in the acting and the story that I forgot I was watching a film. I just, I thought it was either a doc or I was in these, these, this life of these people and it's because of their acting skills for sure uh it's full of you know a lot of emotion um, a real rawness and it gives the viewer kind of the glimpse of these people's lives that maybe you haven't seen before but you feel like you're right right in the middle of it and it talks a lot about the difference between forgetting and forgiveness, which I think is an important distinction. Uh, and it's got art and emotion and drama. And so I really, I really enjoyed this film. And I, I'm glad to see that it's a person of color, their first feature film. And I, I hope that we get to see more from, from everyone in this film. And did I anybody watched else see this it? One. I think... Yeah, I watched it. Did you no. watch it, Ernie? I did. I did. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked this one too. And I'm a big, fan of Andre Holland for, you know, he's also very good looking, I'll just say that, but, but also he's a great <laughs> actor. And I, I kind of thought after Moonlight, he would kind of leap out, you know, he would like, he would just like pop out there and he hasn't, it's just been, yeah. he's kind of been doing these smaller roles and he hasn't gotten a chance to do a lead role. And so it's so wonderful to see him finally get like big, juicy lead role to sink his teeth into. Um, you know, at first I was a little bit like, I wasn't so sure about like the whole, like, crack addict father or whatever I was like okay we've kind of seen this in movies about you know black folks before but the way they handled it and I did watch some of the talk back and they the actor who plays the father said I didn't want it to be this like stereotypical portrayal of like I didn't want him to be just like this loser who slumped in a corner and doesn't do anything so he like coupled that like the whole fact that he had this like extreme work ethic which he passed on to his mm -hmm. son which I thought was very interesting and he he was really because he the the father you know in the talk box said i've seen so many of these kind of portrayals i didn't want to play into those stereotypes which i really liked so yeah you're right this is a film that where the performances really i think carry a lot of it it's also a beautiful looking film so yeah, yeah. sure yeah and that's a really good thing about festivals is you get q a you get to hear a more of a backstory and it does enhance your experience. It's kind of an unfair advantage that films and festivals have versus just going to the theater. But it's also what makes it, you know, really connect with you. Yeah, and, for sure. And I really love that part. Okay, so Ernie, you're up next with yours. Uh, okay, so yes, I saw just over 40 films altogether. Uh, this was both in person and online. So the in person, uh, I can see about four a day. Uh, that's the way they have it scheduled and then it, online you can you kind of get unlimited if you're industry so uh but i try to four days seems to be about my limit uh now in my younger days i could do five or six anyway uh <laughs> so my first one and i deliberately i i wanted to pick films that i knew kind of had distribution so that people could watch these uh because there, there were just so many great films that i saw uh, really only a couple of clunkers, uh, but one of the best ones I saw early on, and this is the in-person viewing only, uh, this is an A24 film called Love Lies Bleeding, uh, and by the time people see this, uh, it may be out. I think it's coming out uh, Friday, March 8th, so depending on when people see this, mm -hmm. it'll probably already be out, uh, but this is a, a new film uh, directed by Rose Glass. Uh, she did St. Maud, which was also at Sundance a couple years ago. Uh, so Love Lights Bleeding is the sort of a, a neo-noir uh, crime thriller movie starring everyone's favorite, Case Stu, 
uh, Princess Diana slash uh, Bella from Twilight, uh, Kristen Stewart. Uh, and it sort of takes place in this world of uh, competitive uh, female bodybuilding. Uh, and, it, you know, like any sort of crime thriller, there's all these sort of like seedy characters and there's, you know, uh, drugs and guns and all this stuff. Uh, but it's just, uh, and there is a twist. It's an A24 twist uh, that um, you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. You're either going to be on board or you're going to be on, uh, it came out of left field, uh, mm -hmm. WTF. And there were a lot of people, again, when it, when in the screening, uh, a lot of people were scratching their heads and just did not like the way it went. Uh, and some people were like all in. So I am 100% all in. Um, I mean, you don't, again, it's a neo-noir. You don't really need to know anything other than, you know, it, these are bad people doing bad things. Uh, and a wonderful uh, sort of cameo uh, guest appearance by um, Ed Harris, who plays uh, Christian Stewart's cool. dad, uh, who's kind of the, uh, uh, I guess he's like the kingpin or the, you know, the crime boss of the world. And uh, he's sort of, you know, pulling some things. So anyway, uh, female bodybuilding, Queer love story, neo noir, Christian Stewart, twist ending, A24. That's all you need to know. What's not to love? love? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I love how you said it's got the A24 twist, which is like, like they, like they branded that. But I, yeah, yeah, I'm excited. It's opening here in Salem pretty soon at Salem Cinema. Um, so it's coming out to theaters so people can enjoy that one. I did not watch this one partially because I didn't want to waste my 10, not waste, but use my few 10 screenings I got on something I knew was coming out to theaters in March. So did you see this one, Brian? I didn't. It was going to be, it could have been with the last film I saw. I'm so tired. I couldn't see it. And my friend, I'm going to read her text. She said, Brian, you totally missed out not seeing Love Lies Bleeding. It was delightfully, brutally batshit. <laughs> so I need to see yeah. it. <laughs> I forgot. That sounds awesome. It has, uh, the other, Fra Franco's brother, not the bad Franco, not the, the, it, the good, Franco. I can't remember his name. Not his Dave brother. Franco, or is that the good Dave one? Franco. I don't know which one's Dave the bad Franco. one. Well, yeah. Well, really, relatively speaking, Dave Franco is in it. Dave. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure which one was the bad Franco. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was like, I don't know. That's a quality. Okay, great. Well, I'm excited about that one. So our next one uh, is my pick. Uh, Girls Will Be Girls by uh, director Sushi Talati, which I'm probably butchering, follows the journey of a 16-year-old girl named Mira, um, who is like at a kind of a private boarding school, and she is the straight-A student, the perfect student, but then she meets this super hot guy, and all of a sudden she's like all into him, and it's a coming-of-age story, one of my favorite genres. The really nice twist with this one is that Mira has got a beautiful mother, I mean, gorgeous, um, played by uh, the fabulous Indian actress, Connie Kasruti, uh, who's been in quite a few films in India, um, who herself kind of, kind of got married young and didn't get her chance to spread her wings. So she's all up in her daughter's business, but not in the way you might think, not in the way like, you shouldn't be out with boys, more like, hey, your boyfriend should stay the night and maybe hang out in my bed. <laughs> so it's, it's a really fun movie. I really loved the performances and I loved that it was unexpected as a coming of age story. It has a beautiful photography. I just thought the photography was amazing. For, for, I think I think this is a first time uh, feature film. And I enjoyed the central performances with the mother and daughter. And I love that the mother in so many of these types of movies, it's often like the parents are awful. And at first, there's some things the mother does that's cringy. But in the end, like, I don't want to give too much away. But the mother turns out to be pretty awesome. And I and and in a very patriarchal culture. And I, I loved that about it. So um, so this is one that has not, as far as I can tell, received any distribution. It is going to be at South by Southwest in March. So maybe I'm hoping it will get a little bit more buzz going for it and get some distribution because I think it would do great on the indie art house circuit. So I don't think, Hart, yeah. you got to see this one. Or you did see it, but that was I, the one you fell asleep on. <laughs> I saw it. It was when I just got home. I had like a day. And yeah, like kind of like Ernie said, I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> and I fell asleep and no no reflection on the film every bit i saw was great <laughs> <laughs> well i did i did see it i did see it too did not fall asleep uh but i did like it and i agree with you angela that um 
you know, coming of age is a very well-worn uh, genre, especially at Sundance. Uh, so for them to sort of find some unique things to do within that framework, I thought was really, oh, it was really great. Including some great acting, some little things that were unexpected. Uh, but hey, anything down with the patriarchy, uh, I'm in favor of. Yes, me too. So that's why I hope it does get some distribution. So we, uh, we only have eight minutes. We have three more movies. Let's okay. go fast. Brian. Your next one. <laughs> okay. My next one is a documentary called Daughters. It's directed by Angela Patton and Natalie Ray. It follows uh, four young girls as they prepare for a special daddy-daughter dance um, with their incarcerated fathers as part of a unique fatherhood program that started in Washington, D.C. Well, I think it started somewhere. So anyway, this is in Washington, D.C. Um, Patton is actually the CEO, CEO of Girls for Change, this nonprofit, and started this um day with the dad program so they spent eight years making this documentary it centers around these four girls that are ages five to 15 and it kind of explores the importance of fatherhood um the and family the devastating bias that goes into incarceration and the ramifications uh, from that uh it was one of my favorite films of the festival by a mile. It's a tearjerker. It's super powerful. It won the audience award and a special uh, festival favorite award. Uh, if you have a bond with your father, or maybe if you don't, I think you'll like this film. Uh, it's just, if you have feelings, you'll like this film. It's just super powerful. It's really hard to describe in a short time. But I will say that Aubrey, the five-year-old, watching her evolve from this innocent, you know, whimsical child, like I'm gonna see my daddy and dancing around and how that changes through the film crushed me. And mm -hmm. uh, I can't stop thinking about this film and how good it was. Nice. Did you see yeah. this one, Ernie? Yeah, thumbs up here. Uh, again, another, uh, you know, incarceration documentaries, you see those all the time. Uh, and uh, again, this, but this has so many, it's so much more than that. and. Uh, like Brian said, I mean, it, it will leave you emotionally devastated. And I'm so glad that it did get picked up, that people could take a look at it. Because, yeah, it deals with the prison system, but it deals with both fatherhood. It deals with so many different things. Uh, it does them all in a in a very uh, wonderful way. So, And it got picked up by Netflix, right? So yeah, they'll bury correct. it, but we'll make sure on Real Film Snobs <laughs> to post when it's on Netflix. So people at least yes. will know about it. Because Netflix will do its thing and just throw it out there and not promote it, I'm yeah. sure. But at least it will get right. an opportunity to be seen. So yeah. I'm excited to see it. Um, so our next one is you, Ernie. Yeah, so my next film is called Thelma. Um, and it got picked up right at the end of the festival by Magnolia. And oh, I think nice. their plans are for a late spring summer release. Uh, so this is directed by uh, an actor, Josh Margolin. I think he... I think this is his directorial debut, but he's been acting for a while, mostly in TV and uh, some small roles. But so Thelma is about uh, this woman, Thelma, played by June Squibb, uh, a woman. She's in her 90s and she sort of gets scammed by, you know, she gets the call from uh, someone pretending to be her grandson asking for all this money. So she falls for it, sends the money uh, and then, of course, finds out that it is a scam. The police say there's really nothing they can do. You know, there's no contact info, and you know this happens all the time. Her family says, "Well, there's nothing we can do either. You know, just got to be careful." Uh, but she decides, "Well, no, I'm going to try to figure out what this is and get my money back and get you know get back at those guys." Uh, so then it's about her uh, being you know 93 and on her own, sort of trying to get revenge on these phone scammer guys enlists the help of one of her friends played by Richard Roundtree, the late Richard Roundtree, AKA Shaft, oh. uh, in his last movie role. Uh, nice. and it's about, uh, you know, about them, you know, uh, going out on their own and, and, uh, going on an adventure. I mean, it's very lighthearted. This is obviously not like a big heavy thing. Uh, but it's just, it's such a fun crowd pleaser, June Squibb. I'm going on the record right now. Oscar nomination. This is she's amazing in this role. Uh, this is a role that you know she's played the supporting character in a lot of other films. People remember her from Nebraska, uh, yeah. but she she really comes into her own, uh, and it's just a fun sort of light romp of uh, you know imagine your grandma, you know on her wheelchair on her walker, you know trying to go after these criminals, you know, uh, 
with Shaft. Uh, so it, it, it was a lot of fun. I know you can't even make that up. I mean, I want to see yeah. it just based on its June squib and Shaft. I mean, that's all yeah. you need to say, yeah. really, on a revenge story <laughs> against scammers. And who doesn't hate those scammers, right? Like, we all know yeah. older people who have been preyed on by them. So it's got to be so satisfying. And I love June Squibb, you know, and she hasn't, she's done little small parts since Nebraska. That was probably her exactly. last really bigger role. And she, I think she got nominated for her role in that movie, but she's just yeah. terrific. So, you know, there's going to be all this heartfelt, like, oh, she's in her nineties. Oh, yeah. So even if she yeah. doesn't win, I think you're right. She'll probably get a nomination because it will be kind of like you're kicking butt in at 93 or whatever, like you're going to get a nomination. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to see this one. And it did get picked up by Magnolia, as you said. So I'll be coming to theaters then, probably, because Magnolia doesn't usually do um, streaming only. And it's like, you know, it, 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 I, don't, I don't mean this in an insult, insulting way, but, you know, crowd pleaser. People use that as putting down a movie. But, you know, was, there's nothing wrong with that. And especially at Sundance, you watch so many heavy movies like Brian, you know, Daughters and all these things. Like, it's just fun to watch just a good, fun sort of light romp especially you know palette cleanse once in a while yeah, right exactly. right yeah sounds great i'm excited for that one well i will end with my movie which is not a palette cleanser which is actually really dark and weird but that's what i like um it's malu <laughs> by director pedro ferrer uh, it's a Brazilian film about a 50-year-old unemployed actress uh, who lives in this home, very kind of rundown home with her mother, um, and also has her daughter coming to visit, who is also an aspiring actress or actually working in theater. And I would say this movie is for people that like Cassavetes. I'll just put it out there. If you don't like Cassavetes, mm -hmm. if you don't like heavy duty acting with lots of people screaming at each other. This isn't the movie for you. <laughs> uh, what I liked about this is it's more of a female perspective because Cassie Betty's films are very masculine, male centric. Um, this is three women, three generations who are all a little bit off their rocker to be quite honest. And they're all in different ways. And they say some of the most horrible things you've ever seen a family member say to each other during the course of this movie, particularly the mother to her daughter. Um, and yet still there's this sense that these people all really need each other and it's just really well written and really well acted i especially love the acting by the lead uh who plays malu uh, yara de nova and she is fantastic as is her daughter carol duarte i just thought it was phenomenal performances i love cassavetti's movies so i love this kind of stuff where it's just like three actors just chewing into the dialogue and getting into it and getting into all of their kind of issues so um so I really enjoyed it. I probably it had, does not have distribution yet. It wouldn't surprise me if it doesn't get distribution. Um, but it was just so well acted and performed. I and I don't think this is a first time director. I think he's directed a few other things. But um, I don't. I know you didn't see this one, Brian and Ernie. I think you didn't like this one as much as I did. <laughs> I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. I didn't like it quite as much. It was a little uh, too maybe too intense or too. Um... Uh, like you said, a lot of yelling, a lot of a lot of hateful things going on. Uh, not that that's bad, but um, again, for me, at, at the time I saw it, it was just a little too much for what I wanted at that time. So it's uh, you got to be in the right mood for it. I didn't expect it, so I just like loved it. Um, so I was yeah, super excited. So uh, we for are out of time. Oh, go uh, ahead. Carol. It's Malu M A L U for in case Malu. people want to send it for for it. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll have it up on the screen too, but Malu, I probably mispronounced it, which is not shocking. Um, so, okay, thank you both for being on the show. Uh, as always, you can check us out on our thank website you. and on YouTube. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Um, thank you very much. Thank you both for being here. Have a great day and great You're weeks. welcome.